Thank you, Paul. <coughs> you better take your notes here. I'm allowed to be making speeches from all of these notes. <laughs> It's an honor and a privilege to represent the National Farmers Union at this great ceremony dedicating the new home of the South Dakota Farmers Union as a symbol of the growth and stability and progress of this great organization. It's always difficult for anyone to substitute for someone previously advertised. And I'm asked by our national president who found it impossible to be here to bring you his greetings and his regrets that he could not be here with you today. But we have problems in Washington on the legislative front that are probably a great deal more important to you in your farming operations, even though I know all of you would have appreciated deeply having our national president here, we felt it was more important for him to be there on the job at hand than to be out here. I spent nearly three months in Washington, uh, leaving our own winter conferences in the middle of January and with only time out for the national convention and I think three flying trips home so that I could uh, justify drawing my salary from North Dakota. Sometimes it seems to me that the folks up there on my staff get along just about as well when I'm in Washington as when I'm home, but I'm afraid if too many people found that out, I might not have a job. So I made three flying trips home for two or three days and the rest of the time since the middle of January has been spent in Washington helping President Patton and the staff down there on what at the outset seemed to be an almost impossible job. Everyone took it for granted that the appropriations for agricultural programs would be very drastically cut in this session of Congress. All of you know that the Farm Bureau and the Grange advocated the complete elimination of ACP payments and a very drastic curtailment of many of the other uh, appropriations for the different phases of the agricultural uh, program. And we were able, through very concentrated work, to get through the House of Representatives, the committee report on agricultural appropriations with substantially no change. One of the problems that President Patton, who was required to stay in Washington for now, is that the Senate Appropriations Committee handling, or the subcommittee handling agricultural appropriations, are now in the process of marking up the Senate bill for appropriations based upon the House action. Now, it is our hope that we can get some of the items fairly substantially increased over on the Senate side. The second thing that President Patton is working on that requires almost constant attention is the effort, and it's a very real effort, I can assure you, to get hearings opened on the price support legislation before the House Agricultural Committee. Congressman Cooley, chairman of the House Committee, has been in Europe for the last two or three weeks and returned to this country only, I think, the early part of this week. I believe we have the thing set up now so that it seems probable we'll get hearings on price support legislation over in the House, I hope, in the not too distant future. The three months of intensive work by President Patton, myself, and the members of the staff down there, together with others who came in on call or who came in because they knew they could be helpful, finally resulted in getting the hearings opened over on the Senate side up until three weeks before Chairman Allender of the Senate Agricultural Committee uh, called those hearings on price support legislation, you couldn't find a man in Washington who wouldn't give you a complete horse laugh if you even talked to him about hearings on price support legislation in this session of Congress. This is an election year. Nobody wants to be on the spot. They all want to be able to come home and make whatever kind of speeches they think they ought to make in order to be reelected to Congress or to the Senate. It will be a short session of Congress because the political conventions uh, start, I think, the 6th of July, and everybody down there 
uh, hopes to be able to adjourn this Congress by around the 1st of July. It now looks, however, like they'll have to recess for the political conventions and probably go back into session uh, along later in the fall. But we did uh, get hearings opened up over on the Senate side and I think made a very good record over there. Uh, I think there are three or four things that I should like to touch on in the time that I want to take on this program this afternoon that it is extremely important, it seems to me, for you to know. First, if we had put the matter wholly and solely upon the financial condition of farmers and their need for higher price supports, regardless of what we know to be the facts, of the financial condition of a large majority of farmers throughout this area, we should not have been able to get the hearings open because the feeling around Washington, generated probably in large degree by the leadership of the American Farm Bureau who are fighting for lower supports and lower appropriations on the, that creates the feeling that farmers are getting along very well, the psychology around Washington is that farmers are doing very well. And uh, the consumer attitude has been that uh, farmers are getting more than they ought to get, uh, relating their thinking, of course, to the retail prices of food that they are required to pay in the grocery store. But we put the matter upon that phase, of course, but on an entirely different set of newly emerging facts that are coming to light now, and that are probably the greatest challenge to the citizens of this country, farm people as well as consumers, and gives a, that, uh, that this country has ever seen and gives a, a, a completely new and different slant to the so-called farm problem than it has ever been given before. And those newly emerging facts arise out of the figures and statistics of the 1950 report of the Federal Census Bureau. And of course those, while they're available to all of the citizens of this country, most people don't take the trouble to get them and to read them, to analyze them and to study them. And I should like to say to you that in my humble opinion, based upon the figures in the 1950 census report, that the people of this great country of ours are rapidly approaching the end of a great era and are now about to start into a new and entirely different era in the history of this great country of ours. Those figures in the 50 census report show that we had about 152 million uh, citizens, people, in this country in 1950. And the minimum, the minimum projections of the Census Bureau, and there are three sets because of some disagreement there, but the minimum projections indicate that we shall have about 195 million population in this country by 1975. Now, of course, your first thought is what's that got to do with the farm problem? Well, I think that that figure is entirely too conservative because the rate of net population increase in the United States for the last going now into three years is nearly three and a half million. And projecting an increase from 152 million to 195 million in 25 years is only at an annual rate of about a million and a half against a present net population increase rate of nearly three and a half million so that some in the Census Bureau believe we might have as many as 225 million people in the United States by 1975. And of course, that's only 25 years, or now only 23 years. What about the period beyond that? Now let's relate that down to agriculture and the food problems of the people of the United States. It means simply this, that by 1975, thinking in terms of the average per acre yields of 1950, we will need the equivalent production in 1975 of an additional 100 million acres of highly productive land in order to provide the same per capita amount of food that was available in 1950. And the sad facts are that there are not 100 million acres of additional land available, productive land in the United States. Even with the maximum that could be done with an expanded soil conservation program bringing whatever new land that might be possible to reclaim and bring into production, probably the maximum is about 25 million acres that might be reclaimed even at great cost per acre and put into production in this country. 
And an additional set of facts, our soil pe soils people tell us that despite all of the soil conservation and soil building work that has been done in the last 20 or 25 years, or in some instances a longer period than that, we are still today overdrawing the soil bank in the United States. In other words, we're taking plant food out of more acres at a more rapid rate than we're either, either holding even or putting plant food back in, so that our production capacity is still on the decline in the United States, despite all that we've done at the present time. Now, that set of facts indicates that if we are to provide the same per capita amount of food to the population in 1975 that we had in 1950, we've got to find ways and means to get vertical increases in production because there no longer is possible any further, any substantial further horizontal increases in terms of the size, acreage-wise, of the agricultural plant in this country. And when you think of that, and think in terms of farm programs. Think back over the history of farm programs. Every piece of farm legislation that has been passed by the Congress of the United States dealing with agriculture, at least on the economic side of agriculture, beginning with the McNary-Haugen bill in the early 1920s, twice vetoed by our president, the Agricultural Marketing Act of 1929, the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933, and then the subsequent amendments and changes on up to and through the 1949 Farm Act, which is presently the agricultural law that's on the federal statute books, every one of those pieces of legislation has been predicated upon these basic assumptions that agriculture had an inexhaustible ability to produce great surpluses and every piece of legislation thus far has been geared and designed to deal with an industry which was a surplus-producing industry and not a deficit-producing industry. So when I say that we're approaching the end of a great era, we're approaching the end of the era where agriculture had the inexhaustible capacity to produce all and more of the food needs of the people of this country. And we're rapidly approaching the beginning of a new era where, era where this great country of ours bids fair to join the great galaxy of deficit food-producing countries around the world. And that poses some problems that the people in this country began to, better began to look at, believe me. If we've got to get vertical increases within the next 25 years, if agriculture isn't something, rebuilding soil isn't something that can just be done by the turn of the clock or by just deciding to do it. It's something that takes years and years and years of planning forward planning and preparation and large sums of money to do. And when you think in terms of the responsibilities of the farm people in this country to meet the food needs of this gra rapidly growing population, then of course you must think in terms of some of the problems that farm people have. And what are they, to be brief about it? Well, manpower is one of those problems. The selective service and the administration of it is tragically reducing the trained manpower resources of agriculture in this country. And then there's an additional factor over and above selective service that's draining off some of what otherwise would be the available manpower. Farmers are not able to pay competitive wages. The average wage for industrial workers in this country, that's the average for all of them, and many of them are higher, is $66 and some cents per week. The average wage for agricultural workers is $35 a week. So that you find right here in South Dakota and in North Dakota and many other places, people who are not eligible for the draft within the age brackets are leaving agriculture and going into jobs in industry and these times of total overall manpower shortage at an alarming rate. So that farmers are confronted, one, with inadequate credit in a great many instances with inadequate manpower for the two particular reasons that I cited. They're confronted with terrifically inflated costs of farm machinery and repair parts because the only place you can substitute in any way for manpower is with additional mechanized labor-saving equipment. And all of you know what the cost of that sort of thing is and the repair parts and all of the things that's involved. We need greatly expanded use of fertilizer, potash and nitrogen and triple superphosphate and that gets into the problem of allocation of steel and scarce materials for factory plant capacity. It gets into the monopoly control of the fertilizer industry and the tremendous 
uh, almost unpayable costs that farmers have to, to pay when they buy the fertilizer and then pay the terrific transportation costs on it out into the area. It, it means that we have to have now a greatly speeded up process and use of the, the new technological processes in agriculture, the use of weedicides, pesticides, insecticides, that whole field, all of which cost either additional money on the part of farmers for equipment or greatly increases their overhead cost of operation. Well, you could, just as I could if I had time, list a list of things that long that are among the handicaps of farmers going all out in terms of their production. And then finally, if you list all of those things, then finally you get down to the provisions of the 1949 Farm Act, which admittedly was geared and designed and drafted to punish surplus production and reward deficit production. So the only way that you could hope to have a reasonable price for your commodities under the law that's presently on the statute books is if, you, if enough farmers were unfortunate enough to have crop failure so that the total supply was less than the people needed in this country. I like something that Senator Kerr said before the Senate committee very well. He said, I hope to this good to our God in heaven that we will always find it possible to be bedeviled with surpluses of food because one way or another we can handle surpluses much better than the people of this country are prepared to handle deficits of food. And if we have deficits of food, where will we get the imports? Because most of the other countries are also deficit food producers. So we started in using that as a basis to convince the people down there that this was no longer a problem of farm relief, where the thing to do on the part of the general public was grudgingly to do as little as was politically possible in order to satisfy farmers. But 152 million people in this country had better begun to find out the facts of life and figure out how they can do the maximum that will be helpful to enable farmers to meet an almost impossible production job in the next 18 or 20 years ahead of us. So on that basis, we were able, going from one senator to another, from one congressman to another, on the, the membership of both the House and the Senate Agricultural Committees to impress on them that here are problems that this country needs to take a new look at and take a new look at uh, now. Obviously, I'm sure that every one of you are familiar with the sliding scale provisions of the 1949 Farm Act. You've heard enough about it and thought enough about it and understand what it means if you're fortunate enough to meet the production goals that the country needs, how your support price slides down on the sliding scale. Uh, Senator Aiken uh, jumped me about that and said, where did you get that sliding scale? He said, why don't you call it an escalator? And I said, well, it depends on where you stand. If you stand at 60% looking up, maybe you could call it an ex es escalator. But so far as I'm concerned, I stand at 100%. And when I look down, it's just a sliding scale. It isn't any escalator business when you look from the top down on it. So, <laughs> we were able to get the hearings established on two bills that had already been introduced one a year ago last January by Senator Young and Senator Russell, and one a year ago last fall by Senator Young, and then about uh, just about a week before the hearings were supposed to open, <coughs> Senator Kerr decided to introduce the price support bill for 100% price supports. He introduced it, and having more pull with Senator Ellinger than I did, he was able to get the doggone thing printed and get it over there and get it made a part of the record and part of the hearing so the testimony could be on that. And that bill makes pretty maximum provisions for 100% of price support on all of the basic commodities, on the oil crops, on the feed crops, and on all of the secondary commodities, that is to say that group of commodities which can only be produced by feeding the primary or feed product commodity. And it extends the dual parity provisions of the present law, and I haven't time to go into detail. I think you know what that means. There are two parities under the present law, and the high one, from our viewpoint, is due to expire on December 31st, 1953, January 1st, 54, whereupon the price of wheat will take a nosedive of 32 cents a bushel or thereabouts, and the price of corn will take a nosedive of about 
15, 16, 17 cents a bushel on the basis of present calculation, though this bill provides for an extension, an indefinite extension of the dual parity provisions of the present law and provides for the application of the dual parity provisions for all of the feed grains in addition to corn. You see, the present dual parity it only takes care of corn among the feed grains. So when we've got, we've, we're three years now into a, further into a deficit position of feed. We're feeding more feed and have going into the third year than we've produced in this country total. And yet we've got oats and barley and grain sorghums on the transitional support business under this present law so that they're on their way down and still going down and only corn held up under the dual provisions of the present law, parity provision. So this bill takes care of all of those things. It doesn't go as far as we should like to go. It doesn't uh, take care of the unit system to provide, to protect family type farmers against further encroachments of the big corporatized type of agriculture. But it will give us 100% of parity price supports on about 20 some commodities, including dairy products, poultry, eggs, hogs, beef, cattle, and so forth across the board. All of the commodities that presently aren't uh, being supported at all. Uh, so <clears throat> we got those hearings over in the Senate. The uh, Farm Bureau testified, Mr. Klein testified, and uh, said that uh, he was against 100% of parity because that would mean regimentation. He was for the present bill, the sliding scale, and the new parity formula. I think most people haven't yet analyzed this new moving parity formula that's supposed to be modernized and a very fine thing for farmers in terms of its impact upon farmers. You know, to just listen to the formula don't mean anything. You've got to take the doggone thing and extend it commodity by commodity to see what actually happens. And I should like to take just a moment or two to do that for you. This new parity, you remember the old parity formula, merely took the base period 1909 to 14, the average of prices there, and related them to present prices, and the average of farmers' costs in the 1909-14 period, and, and related those two things together so that a bushel of wheat using wheat or corn or whatever it was was supposed to buy as much today as it did then. Well, this new parity formula has got some of the doggone jokers in it that you ever run into. It says something like this. You take First, it's based on the most recent 10 years of the, uh, right up to, to not including the current year, but the most recent 10 years last past. Then you take the average of the particular crop, the average corn price or wheat price for the last year, and you divide that into the index of the average of all farm prices for the past year, using uh, the base period 1909 to 14, equaling 100. And you take the index, divide the average price of the one crop into the average price of all of the crops, and then you multiply that by the cost that farmers have <coughs> using 1909 to 1914 as the base period equaling 100. Now, what happens is this. You've got a defense situation at the present time which requires so, some sort of stabilization of prices, so you've got ceilings at 100% of parity. The theory of the 1949 Farm Act, I never agreed with it, but even for those who did, the theory of it was that there wouldn't be ceiling and that you would reward deficit production and punish so-called abundant production so that the price curve on your big crop would go down like this and the price curve on your short supply crop would go up like this. Therefore, your parity price on your long supply crop would go down like this and your parity price on your short supply crop would go up like that. But then you come along with a ceiling at 100% of parity. Well, when you've got a ceiling at 100% of parity, whatever fluctuations there are have got to be below 100% of parity. You can't have some of them below and some of them above. And then secondly, <coughs> moving into a feed deficit period because of our tremendous livestock population, which is needed by the people in this country, we're in a situation where we, we're required the public interest requires to permit the importation of Canadian oats and barley and damaged wheat for feed. So that in, when you raise a deficit crop, which under the theory of the present law was supposed to give you a high price curve so that you would be encouraged to get out of the low price crop into the high price crop, well, you've got the ceiling to stop it at 100% of parity, and then you've got 150 million bushels of oats and 140 million bushels of barley and a couple of hundred million bushels of damaged wheat up in Canada coming in across the line so that you know where the price of oats are today. 
And the result is the formula, this moving average parity formula, provides a mathematical certainty that not only this year, but for the 10 years ahead of you, your parity price is on a downward decline. So that every year your parity price of all of these commodities will be lower than it was the preceding year, and that will last for 10 years ahead. And as long as these conditions prevail, it will continue to go down. So you not only have the sliding scale business of low supports in terms of a percentage of parity, but you've got a declining parity price of every one of these commodities. And even Senator Aiken didn't have any answer to that one. He said apparently there were some factors now that hadn't been given enough consideration in 1949 when they drafted that formula that maybe they really ought to take a new look at. It. I don't know what kind of a look or whether just a look and do nothing. But anyhow, he agreed that there were some factors now and they were pointed out as forcibly as we knew how to do it uh, that did require a new look and that hadn't been taken adequately into account in 1948 and 1949. I believe the investigations of the <coughs> Department of Agriculture will be concluded this week by the Senate Committee. They have found nothing <coughs> that was hoped to be found. Uh, some of them hoped to find uh, a lot of stuff that would justify the elimination of the Commodity Credit Corporation and the support price program. They found nothing, only some minor things. <coughs> Grain conversion by not government people, but by private handlers and so forth, and so far as I know, up to the present time, they haven't found any cooperatives that were guilty of the conversion uh, business. And as quickly as those hearings are, <coughs> are concluded, or that investigation is concluded, then Sen Senator Ellender and his subcommittee have agreed that they'll get right to work as a result of the hearings on the price support legislation and bring out a bill. We've gone farther than that. We've got Sam Rayburn, Speaker of the House of Representatives, urging Chairman Cooley of the House Committee to open hearings immediately. We've got the <coughs> Department of Agriculture helping to draft some legislation to pitch into the offer over in the House. And if necessary, the President of the United States has agreed to call Cooley over to the White House and ask him to open hearings before the, Senate, the House Agricultural Committee. I think we will get a few things done. <laughs> At least I should like to get <coughs> enough things done the fingerprint the boys in both the Senate and the House and let them get up and vote. If we can get these bills out of committee and out on the floor, then they can record their vote and come back and explain to you. If they don't pass that kind of legislation, they can come back when they ask you for your vote and tell you why they voted no. And you'll have some measures and it's to what to do about it on election time this fall. Now I see the time the opportunity to see this wonderful poem you constructed here. I know from our own experience in North Dakota that it is a great stabilizer. It means a great deal to the membership of the organization to have their own home. They don't any longer feel like a sort of a carpetbagger outfit. Back in the early days, if anybody wanted to know where the Farmers Union was, why you, <coughs> you looked in the post office directory and found out where the state secretary lived, or the national secretary, and that's where the, the home office was. Remember, Emil? The national office was in Little Rock, Arkansas, when Mr. Davis was secretary, and when Kennedy was secretary, where the Farmers Union moved to Kankakee, Illinois, and then when Jim Graves was secretary, where the Farmers Union moved to Oklahoma City. And uh, <clears throat> then when we elected Jim Patton president, the doggone thing moved to Denver, Colorado, and we finally built a building out at Denver, so I think that we've got the home established for the National Farmers Union. We have it in North Dakota, Montana has their own home, and you have a beautiful home here. And as a symbol of growth and stability and the fundamental direction and stick to itiveness of the Farmers Union people in this and these other states, this is a great day for the Farmers Union, not only in South Dakota, it's a great day for the whole Farmers Union. And I'm happy to have had a small part in these dedication ceremonies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn Cobbett, for that inspiring message. I'm sure we know something about parity, something about the sliding scale that's in the present farm law. 
I'm hopeful, Glenn, with you that we will be able to do something about it. We'll be most happy, Glenn, to be back. You people rec uh, recollect we had these services set for February 19th. And did we have a blackout that time? As it was a blackout. But <coughs> our good friend <laughs> was very determined. Denver.